sit down as a posture of, of coming before the Lord, uh, we humbly uh, bow before him in confession. Uh, we come before him acknowledging the things that we have failed to do, or the things that we did that we should never have done. And so confession is an opportunity to um, come before the Lord, uh, to acknowledge from your heart uh, those things um, that are against his will. So please join me in confessing our sins this morning uh, based on a portion of the Valley of Vision. O Lord, hear, uh, o, o Lord who hears prayer, teach us to pray. We confess that in our worship of you, the words from our mouths and the feelings of our hearts do not always agree. We carelessly proclaim your name without reverence and humility. We think little of your great mercy. We err both in our hopes and in our fears. We often desire things that injure and mislead us. Spirit, assist us to know what to ask for. Produce in us wise desire by which we may ask right things. Turn our eyes away from the temporal to the eternal. Give us grace to trust in your fatherly goodness. May we seek first your kingdom and its righteousness. We turn to you now in silent confession. Please take a few minutes to confess to your Father. Lord, you who receive our confession, may our spiritual well-being be our chief concern. May our happiness come from your favor, being near to you and serving you. Brothers and sisters, uh, we are reminded again and again of God's grace to us through his son, Jesus Christ. If you'd please stand and hear these words uh, and respond as noted of your assurance of grace to you. O oh God, you have heard our prayer. You have given ear to the words of our mouths together. Behold, God is our helper. The Lord is the upholder of our lives. If you have confessed your sins in Jesus' name, you are forgiven. O oh God, save us by your name and vindicate us by your might. Brothers and sisters, we're going to sing hallelujah, what a savior. Uh, because we have a great Savior in Jesus Christ. So let us sing out this morning.
seated. Well, good morning again. It's good to see you all. As a church, we are privileged to not only meet together, but also to pray together. And so uh, we're going to have a congregational prayer, and then after that, uh, after I'm done praying, we will all join together and have a, a corporate prayer of the Lord's Prayer. Okay? So let's bow. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, you are the Prince of Peace. You are the wonderful Counselor. You are the Mighty God. The government is indeed upon your shoulders. Though the leaders and the peoples of this earth set themselves against you, you rule over all and you do all that you please. You are the judge and all will have to give an account before you. Every excuse will be silenced. Every lie will be exposed. All sin will be held to account. You are the Savior, Lord Jesus. Your blood covers all sin. All are to turn to you for forgiveness, for abundant life. Lord Jesus, you're the one who calls us to pray, for you are the God who hears when we pray. And your word says that the prayer of a righteous person has great power and avails much. So God, in that spirit, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work in our nation in this time of unrest. God, we pray for justice, that those who have done wrong, those who are doing wrong, would be brought to account. God, we pray for forgiveness, that those who are wronged would be shown grace, even as we have been shown grace. We pray for wisdom. God, we're asking that our leaders would make good and just decisions. We pray for compassion. God, would you give us eyes to see broken lives and to see broken communities? We pray for humility, that we would not sit in judgment, but instead would seek to listen and in, to engage. God, we pray for the gift of tears. May we weep over people who are turning away from the Lord. And we pray for the gift of repentance. God, would you give us grace to confess our sins unto you? Would you give us grace that we would make right and seek to make what is right from what we have done wrong? God, we pray for national repentance. Would you... Holy Spirit, bring revival to souls in this nation. Would you turn people to see Jesus as the only hope? And it is the gospel of peace that actually brings peace. God, we lift up those who serve as police, police officers. Uh, namely, we think of our own Josh King. We smile. <laughs> we are so thankful for him, and we thank you for him. Would you grant safety to him, grant safety to those who serve in harm's way? God, particularly for Josh, would you empower him to speak and to live out the gospel in all that he does in his work? May people see him as salt and light. Yesterday in our nation, uh, even throughout the world, we remember what's called D-Day, and so it's appropriate that we would remember those who are serving in the military. God, we particularly today remember Eric David, who is serving in Afghanistan. Father, we pray that you would speed the end of his tour there and that he would be reunited with his family here in Delafield. God, we pray for Elizabeth Dustin. Thank you for her serving the Air Force. Would you bless her? She has a new tour, a new duty in Hawaii. Bless her, Father, even in Hawaii. Yes, would you bless her. <laughs> God, we pray for Enoch Wong. Thank you for his service here at Cornerstone many years. Bless his move back to Maryland. Establish him in his, in his new job, and would you bless his family ties there. Today we pray for RUF, Reform University uh, Fellowship, at the campus of UW-Milwaukee, or UM-Milwaukee, God, we pray for the leaders, uh, Nick and Brad, Maddie Bratcher. 
We pray that you bless their summer plans with students. In particular, we pray for Ezra King, a student there at UM Milwaukee. Give to him bold and fruitful witness to his fellow students. Locally, we pray for Tom Hawking at uh, Kettle Moraine Community Church. God, we pray for that church that they would purpose to proclaim the gospel so that they can say all in their community has heard the message of the good news of Jesus. And God, that's the same prayer for ourselves here at Cornerstone. Our prayer is that not only here in Delafield, Oconomowoc, but all of Waukesha, Waukesha County, would hear the gospel even through us as we would tell out the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. God, bless the remainder of our service. Help us to see and to enjoy your glory. Now we pray as you, Lord Jesus, taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If you are a child, um, normally at this time we would dismiss you, but we're not doing uh, primary praise. And so we're going to ask those who are children who would normally come forward awkwardly. So would you just stand where you are in the pew? And then we're going to have a liturgy on the screen soon. Maybe. There it is. Yay. All right. People of God, what is our prayer for these children? May the Lord be with you. All right. May the word of the Lord grow in your hearts. Go in peace. All right, children, you may be seated. There are a few announcements. Um, let me get to there. So um, if you downloaded your bulletin, oh, I don't see them. They're not here anymore. Are they here? Yeah, they are. All right. All right, so we continue to ask if you would, I'm going to look at the cameras now. If you are planning on visiting in the future, just please RSVP. Uh, that helps us to have planning for the worship here. Also, just want to highlight that we do have a youth group tonight. Aaron King, anything to say? Cushing Park here in Delafield, 6 o'clock. Anything to bring? Bring whatever food you want, and you will provide drinks. And dessert. We're all about dessert. All right. Very good. Missions committee. Um, you can read about that. They are going to meet via Zoom. Do you want to say anything about missions committee on the 14th, this coming one week from today? It'll be a prayer time at 9 a.m. on Zoom. All right. Very good. And then also um, there will be a women's book, summer book study. You can reach out to Christy Eiler for more about that. Very good. Those are our announcements. Would you now please stand for the reading of God's most holy word? Our New Testament reading from Philippians 1, 8 through 26. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? 
I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Jesus Christ will abound on account of me. Our sermon passage and Old Testament reading is from 1 Samuel 31, 1 through 13. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead on Mount Geboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor-bearer was terrified he would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor-bearer and all his men died together the same day. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled, and the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Geboa. They cut off his head, stripped off his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. They put his armor in the temple of Asherah and fastened his body to the wall of Bashan. When the people of Jabesh, Gilead, heard of the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men marched through the night to Bethshan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Bethshan and went to Jabesh, where they burned them. Then they took their bones and buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and they fasted seven days. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Again, good morning. My name is Jamie, one of the pastors here. Glad that you are joining. If you're joining by Zoom or Facebook, an extra warm welcome to you. Uh, We're in this perhaps difficult series. We're looking at, at Saul, the first king of Israel. And we've been studying Saul because we want to learn what does it mean to have a true repentance This is very important because God says that repentance and faith is what he asks of us. And in other words, it's not that God comes along and asks us to be good enough. He does not say try harder. He does not say be more. Instead, he asks us to turn to him to receive his love, to receive his grace, to receive his acceptance. Now, as important as repentance is, it is easy to get it wrong. Uh, Just think this through. It's very easy to say the words, I'm sorry, but then not even mean it. We can say, I repent, but we're really just saying, I just want to move on. I can say, I repent, but it's just mere words, and it's not action. And so here we are. We're looking at this life of Saul, and what we have been seeing is sometimes he gets really close to doing what God asks of him, but he doesn't go all the way. And as we've been seeing in this series, um, Saul is more concerned about his own kingdom than he is about the kingdom of God. And what we're seeing is when he fails to turn to God, it's showing that he's really not loving God, but he's loving himself. Now in this series, we've been seeing that that's actually us. Uh, This whole point of the series is not to criticize Saul and say, Saul, you're such a bad guy. Actually, we're looking at Saul to see our own sinful tendencies And so today we look at this text, and it's another hard text because here Saul literally falls on his own sword. 
Now that phrase, to fall on your own sword, in modern terminology just means that you're supposed to come and take your consequences. But what we see here in the text is uh, Saul is unwilling to face the consequences. This self-death picture is really a picture of Saul's whole life against God. It shows that his whole life has been about self. His whole life is all about Saul. And so ultimately that leads to a destruction of himself. Now today we're going to have three points. Uh, We're going to first look at the downward spiral of self. And then second, we're going to look at the destruction of self. And then third, what is the hope for self? The big idea is this, uh, Jesus gives us life, and since he gives us life, we are to live for him. Let me break that down just a little bit. What we're going to see is that Jesus, he takes the sword for us, and because he takes the sword for us, we can live. And what that's going to mean is we can now have freedom to be dead to ourselves, and that means that we are free to live for someone greater, for something greater than ourselves, and that's living for Jesus and his kingdom. So Jesus gives us life where to live for him. Before we go further, would you please pray with me? God, we pray because we need you. Even as we sang earlier, oh, how we need you every hour. Would you, by your spirit, make us alive to this text? Make me to be clear. Help me to preach with power. But also, would you open the ears who, of those who now listen that they would receive your word and be different because, Jesus, you are speaking to them and by your spirit, you are changing them. So, God, would you do these these amazing things? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, first, let's look at the downward spiral of self. Very succinctly, hear this. A life lived for yourself always is downward. It is not upward. When you are living for yourself, it will always go down. It will never go up. So let's see this in the life of Saul. Let's do a little bit of a review, review of Saul. And what we see is he starts off rather promising, but it ends in tragedy. In chapter 8, what we see is Israel asks for a king. They want to be like the other nations. And so the prophet Samuel warns them and says, um, you don't really want to do that. But then God says, give in. In other words, grant them their request. Give them what they are asking for. In chapter 9... We see that Saul is set apart to be the king. He is tall, dark, and handsome. He is wealthy. He is connected. And in a worldly sense, listen, he is the ideal king. But what we quickly begin to see is in God's eyes, he is not. Because he does not have an apparent heart for God. How do we see that? Verse, not verse, but rather chapter 10. There, uh, the, the prophet Samuel anoints and sets Samuel, or Saul, apart. And what we see is when uh, Saul goes back to his relatives, he's asked and said, well, what did the prophet Samuel say? And if you remember, Saul completely backs away and says, he just told me where the donkeys are. He says nothing about being anointed. Also in that chapter, though, we see that God gave to Saul a clear command, go attack the Philistines. But Saul does not do that. He does not obey God. In chapter 13, we see that when Saul does go fight the Philistines, he's supposed to wait for Samuel to make a sacrifice. But he doesn't wait. He does not do what he's told to do. He does not honor God. In chapter 15, we see that Saul is given a command to destroy the Amalekites. But he does not do so completely. He saves the best. And when he is confronted by the uh, prophet Samuel, he begins to make excuses, and he wants to just save face before the others. And it's at that time that the Samuel, prophet Samuel says, Saul, because you have not obeyed the Lord, because you've rejected the Lord, the Lord now rejects you as king, and it's going to be torn away from you. Things then begin to spiral really fast. Uh, If you remember in chapter 22, Saul thinks that the priests are in his way, so he kills them. (laughs) In chapter 26, David, his most loyal and successful general, who's been protecting uh, Saul all along, he tries to kill him as well. 
And in chapter 28, which we saw last week, in desperation, Saul goes and he summons uh, the prophet Samuel from the dead. And then here is this, uh, if you will, kind of summoned Samuel. And what does he say to Saul? That's the same message he's been saying all along. You've been rejected as the king. You've had so many opportunities to repent, Saul. You've had so many opportunities to turn back to the Lord, but you've never done that. And so now we come to chapter 31. Here is Saul. He is in battle with the Philistines. His sons are dead. He's badly wounded. And he's not thinking of his duties as the king. As the king, he is to lead God's people. As the king, he is the one who is to fight to the very end. And he's thinking about himself. He does not want to be mistreated. He is fearing his enemies more than he is fearing God. He's thinking of himself more than he's thinking of others or than he's thinking of God. Now, when we look at this life of Saul in review, it's not that he got more sinful. Rather, his heart for himself became more obvious. As his life progressed, what we saw is that this pattern of turning away from God became more and more evident, more pronounced. And what we see in Saul is a man who digs in his heels. This is a man who resists God again and again. Now, in our own lives, I think we see this. Sometimes we see this in movies. As I was studying the life of Saul, I actually thought of the movie Citizen Kane. Um, there you remember that movie about Charles Foster Kane, uh, loosely based upon uh, the real-life person, uh, William Randolph Hearst. And so here is uh, Citizen Kane, and he's a newspaper magnate, and he is incredibly successful. Um, if you will, he builds this immense empire, and all people are bowing down to him. He controls everything. But if you remember the end of that movie, in the end, he dies alone, <laughs> uttering rosebud as the snow globe drops from his hand onto the ground and shatters. Rosebud being that childhood sled that was taken away from him as he was taken away from his family to go to boarding school on the East Coast. There we see in Citizen Kane, kind of like this Saul-type figure, he has all things, but he loses all things because his life is all about him. Sometimes we see this in our friends, though. We think of friends who have a hard marriage. We go to visit with our friends, and we see them bickering before our very eyes, and we're wondering, why are they bickering? And we see that what the pattern is, is rather than focusing on the other person, they're just focusing on themselves. And when we focus on ourselves, things begin to spiral downward. But the question for us here is, how do you see this in you? What is your downward spiral? Where are you going downward and not upward? One way to think this through is just think of one area, one area where you need to be right. Think of an area where you must be right. This is the area where you do not budge. This is an area where you do not listen to other people because you don't need to listen to other people because you're right. This is the area where you shut out all other opinions because why even bother with other opinions? Because you're right. This is where discussion and even debate is not allowed. It's only argument because you are right. And for clarity, I'm not talking about situations where, you know, someone's asking you to deny Jesus or die. We just don't live in that type of persecution in our country. I'm talking about everyday life situations. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big. And our purpose here is not to necessarily call them out right now or even to justify them. The heart of this is right now is what's at, what's going on in your heart. Let me put it differently. Why are you so ready to die to be right for this certain thing? Why are you so wrapped up around this one thing, this one thing of being right? When we start to ask that question and answer it honestly, I desire to be right because it's all about me. It's all about my reputation. It's all about what defines me. 
It's all about what I think is owed to me, what's entitled to me. I need to be right because this is somehow my glory. Friends, when you are insisting on being right, what is the universal, and I can say that, universal result? The universal result is you rarely win people over when you're just being right. When it's all about you being right, what do people do? They run away from you. <laughs> when it's all about you just being right, what do people do? They ignore you. When it's all about you being right, people just make excuses about you and they say, oh, that's just the way he is. That's just the way she is. You see, when you are just about being right, when people are around you, they don't feel like you're lifting them up to God. They actually feel like they're spiraling downward toward despair because it's all about you and you being right. Now we look at this, we need to say, you know what, we all do that. We are all guilty of this. And here we see this text, and this text of Saul is helping us to see, it's opening up our eyes. A life lived for self always goes downward and never goes upward. It's only about you. So let's look at the second point, and that's the destruction of self. What's the result? A life lived for self always and only ends with self. Let me say that again. A life lived for self always and only ends with self. If I was to put this differently, if all that you live for is you, guess what? You is all that you get in the end. Let's look at the text. Here is Saul. He is in battle. He's wounded. He does not want the enemy to mistreat him. That's certainly understandable. Who wants to be mocked? Um, who wants to even be tortured? And yet here we look at Saul, and Saul is not trusting in the will of God. Saul is not resting in the sovereign hand of God. We go back to chapter 14 in this book of 1 Samuel, and what we see in chapter 14 is Saul is in the battle with the Philistines the first time, and God miraculously comes through. In chapter 14, what we see, God comes along, and what he does is something amazing. He causes the earth to tremble, the Philistines begin to actually panic, and it throws them into confusion, and so it becomes an easy battle for the Israelites. Here is Saul. He knows that God is able to deliver, even supernaturally, but even if God is not going to deliver, God could give him strength and courage to die in battle bravely on behalf of his people. But Saul does not turn to God. Instead, Saul falls on his own sword. And it shows that his life was about himself to the very end. Just think this through. If the life was actually for his troops, he would have been leading his troops to the very end. If his life was about the preservation of his people, he would have been leading and fighting for them to the very end. If his life was about the glory of God, he would have been fighting to the very end. What is Saul's reward for living for himself? Listen, only himself. He got exactly what he wanted. He got exactly what he was working for, and it's himself. There's a hard principle, but it's actually a just principle, and it's this. God is just. When we say God is just, what that means is he gives us over to the things that we actually want and desire. And so God and justice, those who live their lives for themselves, are given over to themselves. Now some in this world might say, that is great. I love that. I love that God just leaves me to myself. He just leaves us alone. But this is why this text is so important. Friends, listen. <laughs> the text is showing the dire consequences of what happens when you live for yourself. A life lived for self only ends and results in self. There's only you in the end. That's why the scriptures warn and they say, hey, beware of the trappings of wealth. If you're living your whole life for wealth, what does wealth deliver? Nothing, because you can't take it with you. It goes to someone else. <laughs> That's why the Bible says, do not live for your beauty or for your popularity because it always fades. Do not live for power, for prestige, 
because it's always passed on to someone else. It's temporary. Do not live for pleasure even, because pleasure is fleeting. It's empty. And in the big scale of things, it's meaningless. The final justice for those who live only for themselves is hell. You're given over to yourself for all eternity. Uh, recently, some of you are aware of uh, what's called Babylon Bee. It's a satire site. I love their tagline, uh, fake news that you can trust. And um, <laughs> they just a recent article, or you know, a little quip there was, uh, they were satir- satirizing that in American Christianity, most of us understand what hell is through our understanding and reading of Gary Larson's The Far Side. And so most of us, we think that hell is playing the accordion forever. Most of us, we think hell is somehow cafeteria food forever. Uh, We think that hell is sometimes going to aerobics class forever. (laughs) Um, We laugh, that's not hell. The reality is that death is the great equalizer. When you die, what you've been living for is consumed, even yourself. And so the Bible is very clear, hell is actually living with yourself in your sinful self forever. That's the eternal destruction. You in your sinfulness, stuck, if you will, with yourself forever. And that's why it's described as this lake of fire. And so as we start to look at this text, we begin to say, well, where's the hope in this? You're kind of actually bringing me down. (laughs) Now, before we get to the third point, I need to make a very, very important note, and it's a note regarding suicide. Some have asked, is suicide sin? Yes, it is sin. It's an unjust taking of one's life. It is a destroying the temple of God. Is it an unforgivable sin? No. Remember, we are saved by belief and not by our own obedience. We are saved by faith in Christ and not what I have done. And so, um, is it the unforgivable sin? No, it's not. Remember, unbelief is the unforgivable sin. A refusal to repent is the unforgivable sin. So can you commit suicide and go to heaven? Yes. If you are saved by faith and not by your own obedience, even in that moment, though it is disobedience, you are saved by faith. And so there are Christians, there are those who are born again, those are, there are those who have truly believed, and yet they've committed suicide, and they are in heaven. So then it becomes a question of, well, why, why do Christians commit suicide? And that's a really complex answer. In my pastoral experience, I find it's often depression. Sometimes it's drugs, alcohol. Um, sometimes it's abuse suffered, particularly as a child. I think the underlying, if you will, word is hopelessness. And also as a pastor, though, I have found that most people have wrestled with thoughts of suicide, some more than others, I get that. And I think what's very important is if you are wrestling with suicide, friends, you need to call and get help even today. Call me. Uh, if you're watching call me, text me, email me. If you are here, pull me aside after the service. Today is the day to address that and get help. If you are here and your family has somehow suffered from suicide, we're sorry. There is nothing more than to walk with you in the tears and the sorrow that suicide and the pain causes. I want to share very personally uh, with me, I've wrestled with thoughts of suicide. Sometimes it's the pain of ministry itself. Uh, We see that even in the scriptures. Um, You think of the prophet Elijah, and after uh, Jezebel gets really upset with him, he flees to the desert, and he says, Take away my life, Lord. Recently just finished reading the book of Jeremiah, and one of the things that Jeremiah says in chapter 12, he says, I wish I was never born. Ministry is tough, and sometimes you think, God, is it worth living? But often, for me, it's just my own anger and self-pity that things are not going my way. And so I'm like the prophet Jonah. (laughs) It's better for me to die than to live. But other times, it's just coping with the darkness of life. Friends, 
Debbie and I, we have moments of despair in caring for our daughter with profound special needs, our daughter Hannah. Sometimes it is so hard. And we cry out the cry of Psalm 88, O oh Lord, we cry to you, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. So I wrestle with these thoughts. What I want to share is every time I'm in that spot, you know what? The focus is on me. It's actually all about me. Self. And the one thing that brings me out every single time is this. When the shift of the focus on me goes to the Lord Jesus Christ. When it's no longer about me, but about God, that's what brings me out of the dark place. And that actually is the right intro into our third point. What is the hope for self? Here in this text, to have true hope, we must live for something that is beyond ourselves. See, this is the message of all the Bible. All the Bible is saying, what we live for is not ourselves, but we live for the Lord Jesus Christ because he is our ultimate hope. That is the only hope for self. You know, often people turn to religion for hope, and that's a good thing. But the problem is they approach the Bible, they approach God, they approach religion like it's some self-help thing. In other words, I'm going to do these things to become a better me, a better you. You've heard that tag. But that's not the message of the Bible. The Bible is not all about you becoming a better you. The Bible is about you becoming a whole you or a healed you. What does that mean? The Bible says that the problem with ourselves is so bad that no matter how hard you try, no matter how much self-help you might engage, it doesn't fix or mend your heart. <laughs> the Bible says instead you must die to yourself. And that doesn't mean you kill yourself like Saul, but it means dying to your first placeness in this world. In other words, you die to the notion that life is somehow all about you. So that means that you die to your comforts. Listen, even in this time of like mask wearing, it means even dying to your rights. Now why would a person want to even do that? Because you know what? As we've been seeing, self always leads to a downward spiral. Self, live for self, its ultimate end is destruction. We can't save ourselves. So then a person might ask, well, then if I die to myself, where's my hope in that? Your hope is that you are free to live for something that is beyond you. You're now free to live for God. What is the gospel? The gospel says I can die for myself or to myself because Jesus Christ, the Lord, has died for me. What do we read in the prophet Isaiah? He, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. John chapter 19, verse 34, one of the soldiers, when Jesus was uh, hanging on the cross, came and with his expertise put the sword into Jesus' side to make sure that he was dead. He was pierced and outflowed blood and water. The blood from his heart but then the water from the stress and the, just the absolute agony that he was going through. Jesus really died. The God who made all things died for us. And what that means is there's no, there's no need to fall on our own sword. We fall on our sword today to cover our shame, to somehow run away from our failures. But if the gospel says that God became man in the Lord Jesus Christ to take the sword for us, the debt is paid. Shame is gone. We are free. And what that means is we're free to not be right. <laughs> now a person might say, you know what, but they wronged me. The gospel says, yes, they did wrong you, but now you are free to even forgive those who wrong you. You don't have to get them back. But if I don't say anything, then they'll get away with it. You know what? Jesus, he will take care of it. He is the just judge. But my life, my comforts, my rights, they're threatened. Sometimes they are. But listen to that. My life, my comforts, my rights are all temporary. 
And the gospel says, live for that which is eternal. Live for that which is forever. And so what this means is, I'm free to not have to be right. Let me put it differently. I'm free to be wrong about things. I'm free to be wrong about things that are other than the gospel. That's the one thing we must be right about. And that's believing upon the Lord Jesus and being saved. All other things, they do not define you. They do not control you. And so they're, you're freed from them. Let me conclude just by addressing what's going on in our nation. Ben, I appreciate the letter that you sent out. I appreciate sharing how you and your family are wrestling with current events just surrounding what's going on with uh, the death of George Floyd. Um, when things started coming out a couple of weeks ago, what I did is I re-listened to a sermon, to a talk by a guy named Tom Skinner. Some of you remember Tom Skinner. Some of you who are older might remember who he is. Uh, he was called the Prophet of Harlem. And um, he gave a talk at the 1970 uh, Urbana Missions Conference. I was only two at that time. <laughs> but um, the name of his talk was The U.S. Racial Crisis and World Evangelism. So at that time in 1970, what we're seeing now today was similarly going on then. And so he was addressing about uh, 10 to 15,000 students there at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana campus in their uh, big field house. And um, I came on to this particular talk because I myself was part of InterVarsity, uh, which was the Urbana conference. And so I was put on to this, and I, I heard it, you know, some years ago, and then I thought, I want to listen to that again. It's impacted me. Let me just go through something, and I want to focus on what he says at the end. So he starts off with a history of slavery and a development of racism in the United States. And you have to understand, uh, Thomas Skinner is an African-American man. He's now deceased. Um, he actually settled to where David and I used to live in Southern Maryland, and he died from uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, so he starts about the history of slavery, the development of racism in the United States. Then he shares his testimony, how he was raised in Harlem. And he saw the church basically just supporting the status quo. And he was really turned off by that. And since the church was not speaking to the issues that were going on in Harlem, he started to listen to other voices. He started to listen to Malcolm X. He started to listen to Louis Farrakhan. And what he found out is that they too could not give a meaningful answer to the problems that were going on in Harlem. So he shares one day, one night, he was preparing for a big gang fight because he was part of a gang. And the rock station to which he was listening actually somehow got switched, and a guy was preaching. This is amazing. And the preacher shared from 2 Corinthians, and in 2 Corinthians 5.17 it was said, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things that are old have passed away. Behold, all things that are new have now come. And when he heard that, the Spirit prompted him so much that he said, there's something there that I need to have. And so he started to read the Bible, and upon reading the Bible, he saw the sinfulness of his own sin. He became in awe of the Lord Jesus, and he was converted. And not just like what we call little conversion, he was all out, I'm for Jesus. So in this uh, particular talk, after his testimony, he addresses who's the real enemy. The real enemy is not a person of different color. The real enemy is Satan. He's the one who is sowing this discord. And then he calls the church to stand up by faith and action. In other words, James, the apostle, faith without works is dead. We must believe, but we also must do something. And then he concludes talking about two Jesuses, and this is where I want to slow down briefly, okay? Two Jesuses, you might be thinking, what's that? He talks about Barabbas and Jesus, and he appeals to, um, in Matthew's account in his gospel, Matthew chapter 26, one of the ancient uh, manuscripts, a Syriac uh, manuscript, actually says that Barabbas' name is Jesus Barabbas, and so, which is common. Uh, Jesus was actually a common name. It's Joshua, Yeshua. And that makes sense, kind of like we have our own names such as that. And so, like Josh, Joshua. 
Um, so here he says, there's two, two Jesuses, Barabbas and then G Jesus of Nazareth. And here is Pilate, and Pilate is going to the crowd, and he says, which Jesus do you want me to release? Which Jesus are you going to say, I'm going to follow? One Jesus, uh, Barabbas, he's an insurrectionist. The other Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, he's also bringing about a revolution. See, that's what Thomas Skinner brings out. Both Jesuses want to change the system. Both Jesuses are starting a revolution, if you will. Which one are you going to follow? Barabbas says, I'm going to take on violence with more violence. And do you see, that's the pattern of self. Self says, I'm going to deal with this, and I'm going to deal with it my way, and I'm going to deal with it with violence. Jesus says, it's not about self, it's about the glory of God. And so Jesus of Nazareth says, I'm going to take the violence, not on others, but upon me. And so Jesus pays for our sin, and now we are freed from that need of violence. He goes on and he talks about to stop the, the Barabbases of the world, we, we stop them by just suppressing them and even killing them. See, that's the consequence of self. But then he goes on and he says, you cannot stop Jesus of Nazareth because he did not live for self. He lived for the glory of God, and he is risen from the dead, and he brings about an ultimate freedom, that freedom from sin, that freedom from Satan, that freedom from self. I just find that that's a powerful talk for today's age. As we look at what's going on, the solution is definitely not self. But it's how are we going to lay down our lives for others? I don't want to lay down, um, and in other words, it's not your life for me, but my life for you. That's the gospel. Now, how do we address all this? Where do we start? I say we start with prayer. That's always the best place, because that's a turning to God in humility. First Timothy chapter 2 says we are to pray for our leaders, and that means we pray for justice. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for wisdom. Psalm 122 says we are to pray for the peace of our nation. And so that means if we want true change to come in our world, the church needs to do, it needs to step up and lead. Now I confess I don't know what that looks like, <laughs> at least not yet, but it does begin with prayer. Because through prayer we begin to repent and through repenting we're turning to God and saying, God, what is it that you want us to do? You know, the focus, the focus today is to say the problems in Minneapolis, the, pro, the, the problems in Milwaukee, <laughs> the problems in Madison. Friends, the problem is actually in my heart. The problem is in your heart. It's easy to say because the problem is not here, it's not my problem. Since I'm not seeing this actually go on in my own community, it's not my problem. Friends, that's a self-focus. So again, where do we start? We start with prayer. Focusing not on the demands of self, but the other and their good. It's only the gospel that will bring healing. We know that. But we begin by engaging that by saying, God, I need to pray. Would you show me what is my role? At the very minimum today, we see that Jesus heats the one who takes the sword for us. So we don't not... We don't need to wield the sword, and we can now be freed from living from ourselves. But we're also now dead to ourselves, because Jesus has paid for all our sin. <laughs> and so now we're free to live for something greater, to live for Jesus and his kingdom. So since Jesus gives us life, let us live for him. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we do live in times that are challenging. It's not just corona. It's even just the unrest in our own nation. But today we're starting to see that there's an even greater problem, and it's not out there, it's in me. It's my own selfishness. 
when I see that the problem is elsewhere, I rationalize, I don't have to worry about it. But that's not a biblical response. Because what we're seeing is that's a selfish response. That's all about me. And Jesus, you're showing us today that when a life is lived all about me, it actually ends in destruction. Now the gospel is, Jesus, you took that destruction on my behalf. And because you did that for me, you were selfless, I can now be selfless. But it's a hard thing. <laughs> so Lord Jesus, would you give us your spirit? Would you begin this work in us first by just praying that we would repent, that we would turn to you and say, God, we are selfish people. And we confess that that is sin. Would you give us grace to die to ourselves, meaning that it's no longer about me, but it's about you. Because you are the one who gives life. Because you laid down your life freely, willingly, lovingly. So Lord Jesus, we do pray for ourselves. We repent. We turn to you with whole hearts. Where there is sin, we confess it right now. Holy Spirit, put off that sin in our lives. God, would you be working in us? Make us to be a people who pray. We pray for our leaders. Do indeed give them wisdom. Give them justice. Give them forgiveness. We ask, Holy Spirit, move in this church that we would step out and that we would lead in some way. Show us how to do that. And show us how to live for you, Lord Jesus, not for ourselves, but for you here in Waukesha County. God, all to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We come now to a time of the Lord's Supper. And um, this is the first time we've been taking supper since the month of March. So this is a sweet time. As we come to this supper, what we see is the Lord Jesus is the one, it was his body that was given for us. He was the one who took the sword so that we could be free and forgiven. It was the Lord Jesus who poured out his blood so that all our sin is paid in full. So as we come to this meal, we come not only remembering, we come participating. What does that mean? We're saying, Jesus, we need you to fill me. Jesus, I need you to strengthen me so that I would live for you. I need this meal right now to remind me not just who you are, Lord Jesus, but I need you to be at work in me so that I'm not living for myself, but I'm living for you and you alone. So as we come to this meal, we're coming saying, God, give me grace to live beyond myself, to live for you. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink in remembrance of me. As we come, we come by faith saying, Jesus, I believe that you are present in these elements spiritually, not physically, not carnally do we take of Jesus, but we take of him saying, Jesus, I need you to fill me up so that my life is not all about me. Since uh, we're in this unusual time of COVID, what you're gonna see is um, it's an all-in-one unit. We've never done this before, so let me show you, okay? So there's going to be a red foil wrapper that you peel back, and that reveals the juice. But what's difficult about these is there's a thin see-through foil at the very top that reveals a wafer. All right? So this is the bread today, okay? So this is the bread, and then you'll take that, and then very carefully, because I'm finding that these things do not peel back quickly. So if you end up spilling on yourself, you're okay. It's just juice. It will clean up. But I'm just giving you a heads up. Peel it back carefully. See that? And then um, I will prompt us. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll give you some time to kind of figure out the little individual unit, okay, uh, after everyone's been served. And then what we'll do is we'll take the bread, and then we'll take the cup, and then we'll pray. 
So the way that we'll do this is you all are very smart people. You're very, very wonderfully brilliant. This is great. So what we're going to do is Ben will be serving on that side. I'll be serving on this side. And you can just uh, go in that direction. Just kind of come forward as best as possible. Observe, you know, the safe distancing stuff. Um, if you're with your family unit, I don't care if you're like this close to each other. You've been living that close to each other the whole time, all right? So we're not saying socially distance from your family. Just kind of appropriately dismiss yourself. So what we'll do is we'll start. Um, we better do the back rows, our first front rows first. Let me think this through. Probably better to do the back rows. Yeah, let's do the back rows first. All right. Okay. I'm going to pray for us. Oh, there's hand sanitizer too. But before we go further, did I already pray? I think I already prayed. I can't remember. <laughs> People watching are like, is this for real? It is. All right. <laughs> Let me pray again. God, as we partake of this meal, um, it is a little bit awkward because we've not done it this way before. God, we're asking that we would see Jesus. That's what we want. Jesus, we want our lives to be about you. Use this meal to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So there's hand sanitizer. And worship team's going to sing. Do you have your individual units? All right. Back rows come forward. Please come forward. Oh, you should like, come this way and come down this aisle. But you can come down that aisle too. Body and the blood of the Lord Jesus given for you. Christ body and blood. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. Has everyone been served who wants to be served? All right. Has everyone figured out these little individual units? I see people smirking and smiling. All right. Church of God, the body of Christ, his body for us, that we might live. Likewise, the cup, Christ's blood, he was pierced for us so that we would not have to fall on the sword. Let us drink.
And I guess when you're done, just put it in the little thing in the front of the pew. Sounds good. All right. Let me pray for us. God, again, thank you for this time. Uh, just even with tears, it's good to take of the supper again. It's good to be reminded and fed with you, Lord Jesus. So, Father, um, make us strong by the grace you've now given us. As we would depart from this place, as we sing this one last song, may we sing out with joyfulness, because you are the one for whom we live. We pray in your name. Amen. Would you please rise? Let us sing. question that I was asked is, if I want to give my tithe and offering, can I still use the box, or does everything need to be online? You can still use the box, all right? So uh, part of our worship is giving and giving back to the king and saying, God, grow your kingdom. So however you're giving, give uh, generously unto the Lord. All right, our benediction. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go in his peace. Go in his grace. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.